Welcome back. Now we answer questions we receive from you, our viewers. If you have a question, visit our website, QuranSpeaks.com. Dr. Shabir, the question is, are there any Islamic reasons for the Taliban to ban women from attending university, or are the reasons cultural or political? It's, it looks like it could be all of these, uh, cultural, uh, political, uh, to an extent. Uh, and, and also, uh, you know, one might uh, bring to bear in, on this discussion uh, traditional mores and customs in early Islamic societies. Uh, but uh, one has to understand uh, the, the Quran better than, than this. To, you know, the Quran stresses the, the acquisition of knowledge. Um, and so to ban girls from high school and from university, this is atrocious in our modern times because uh, there, there might have been a time in history when women generally were not educated uh, and, uh, you know, the women did not go out. The men did the outdoor stuff. The women were at home and uh, the men were the hunters. The women were the gatherers and, and so on. But, but societies have changed. And, and the Quran welcomes this change. And we see that in the early uh, Muslim societies, under the, the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him's guidance, uh, Muslim women, including the wives of the Prophet, peace be upon him, were there active in society. They were there with uh, uh, Muslims in the battlefield. Uh, they were, you know, traders. Um, they could sell in a market and, and, and so on. Um, so once uh, education becomes, uh, you know, in vogue, and, and that's what the Quran introduced, uh, the emphasis on knowledge, so people were trading in knowledge. Uh, Muslim women were at the forefront of this as well. There were many Muslim women teachers in our history. Many of our great Muslim scholars who are men and, and more notable in our history uh, would recount in their biographies the, the names of their teachers. And among the, the names of the teachers, we can find many who are women, to the extent that uh, a, a present-day scholar, um, Akram Nadawi in the, in the UK, has mm -hmm. actually written a voluminous um, uh, tome in, in which uh, he uh, recounts the lives of uh, Muslim women scholars in our history. So there were not just one or two, there were many. So Dr. Shabir, if Islam places such an emphasis on education, right, and if women in early Islam were very active in society, um, within the constraints of the society that they were in, right, because it was a very patriarchal kind of society, um, then where are the prohibitions about women um, pursuing education? Where are they coming from? I think it's largely coming from, from a sense uh, that when, when men and women um, mingle, uh, they're like magnets, they're drawn to each other, you know, either within marriage or even outside of marriage. And of course, uh, adultery is something that is totally forbidden in the Islamic tradition. And the Quran speaks sternly against uh, adultery. So uh, Muslim scholarship tended to think that, okay, anything that will uh, possibly lead to a, a sin, that too should be curtailed. Hmm. Um, and, and so if we have men and women mixing together, then, you know, uh, you're going to fall into sin. So let's, let's block this. Let's uh, nip the um, error, like let, let's nip it in the bud, mm -hmm. right? Uh, so, uh, and then, uh, so come to the field of work. If men and women work together, well, it's not practical for them to work together. So let only the men go out to work. The women are at home. Then society is safe from sin. Uh, come to the university, you know, young men and women studying together, they're going to fall into error. Uh, so better to just have the men and the, the, the boys in the university, the girls at home, and uh, okay, they wouldn't be educated, but at least they will be safe from sin. This, this is the kind of thinking uh, that, that governs this, uh, this uh, strategy to, uh, to separate the boys and the girls and, and so on. So uh, the counter to that, of course, is to recognize that uh, there is a certain degree of tolerance for sin uh, in the Islamic tradition itself. Like God is very to tolerant. The Quran describes God by many beautiful names. One of his names is Halim. He is Halim, which means that he's forbearing. Mm. Uh, like, you know, people will be doing wrong and he's patient and he's seeing them doing wrong and, and he's okay to with a certain degree of wrong. Like mm -hmm. when it gets to a certain sta uh, stage, he will do something. Mm -hmm. um, and of course, we shouldn't, uh, ourselves, we, we, we shouldn't be complacent with doing wrong. But we have to strike a balance. So let's say, you know, the mosque situation. You say, okay, let only the men come to the mosque. So men will come to the mosque. They won't see women. They won't have any, any bad thoughts about women and so on. And they will just be thinking about God. They pray and they go. So that seems good. 
Uh, but uh, we, on the other hand, if they saw women in the mosque, maybe they start thinking about something else instead of God and, and so on. So that's bad. But the thing is that if you say, let only the men come to the mosque because that is good, the downside of it is that the women would not be educated in, in the mosque as the men are. Mm -hmm. and, and they would not get that spiritual sense that is there in the mosque, which you do not find elsewhere. Like, you know, you can't say you'll find it at home. Otherwise, the men would have been able to find it at home as well. But it's just not there like it is in the mosque. So a similar thing, like if you say, okay, let only the boys be in the university, sure, they will get educated and they will be like maybe um, as straight as straight can be. Uh, maybe they'll be attracted to other boys. Um, uh, but if they have girls in the university, yeah, maybe they'll be attracted. Maybe they'll think of getting married and, and maybe they'll do something out of marriage, which is bad. But, but the benefit to society uh, overall is that uh, women will become as educated as the men are May, maybe even better so, and will become leaders and managers and, you know, contributors to society, uh, which we need. In, mm -hmm. uh, and, and that's what, uh, to a large extent, is causing uh, other societies to progress. And uh, to a certain extent, the Muslim societies tend to uh, regress uh, for, for the lack of uh, education in general and the lack of education of the girls in particular. So think of the big picture then, Dr. Spear. Yeah, you have to think of the big picture and recognize a certain degree of tolerance which is built into the system. Like some people, when, when, when they're new to the faith, they want to do everything right they, because they understand it in a superficial way. Just tell me clearly, is it black or white? Mm -hmm. And they don't recognize there's so many great shades of gray in between. Um, uh, God, in his wisdom, has given us such a law that is very practical, that is very flexible. And we see that practicality and flexibility in many things. For example, when we come to the fast of Ramadan, we know that uh, eating or drinking is going to break your fast. Mm -hmm. But then what qualifies as eating or drinking? Like how much do you have to eat or drink for your fast to actually be, be broken? Well, generally, we would say even a sip of water deliberately consumed will break your fast. But look what happens. Uh, we, we wash before prayer. We, we make wudu ablutions. Mm -hmm. And part of the, the ablution process is to put water in our mouths. And normally we would gargle excessively uh, to wash the back of the throat, uh, you know, as deep as a gargle would go. But when we are fasting, we're advised not to do it so extensively, but just in a mild way, put the water in and uh, rinse it, spit it back out. Uh, so as to not uh, be at risk of swallowing some. But nonetheless, the putting water in your mouth is refreshing. And uh, some is going to be absorbed uh, anyway mm -hmm. um, without your intending it. So, but, but that's, that's allowed. And more than this, uh, our classical books of Islamic jurisprudence uh, uh, declare that if you have to buy something and you want to sample it, uh, especially an, an edible item, and uh, uh, so, so you can sample it even while you're, uh, while you're fasting, not to swallow it, Mm -hmm. Because now they start thinking, okay, swallowing, that's the, the you know, when it goes Digestive down this road, process, yeah. that is when it um, breaks the fast. Mm -hmm. But uh, just merely tasting it um, is not going to break your fast. Mm -hmm. Now, normally you wouldn't taste anything, right, but uh, while you're fasting, but for the purpose of buying and uh, making sure you're getting something good. Now, if somebody wanted to be so totally pious and religious, one would say, you know, I'm fasting and I'm going to buy the thing. I don't need to taste it. For the sake of God, I'll just buy it. Whether it's good or bad, I've bought it and I'm going to live with it because I'm fasting for the sake of God. I don't want to, you know, impugn on my fast in any way. Well, somebody who wants to go that route, they have that uh, privilege uh, and choice, but we cannot impose this on society. You cannot mm -hmm. go to the next person and say, hey, man, you're fasting. How, how, uh, you know, how, how come you're tasting the grapes when, while you're fasting? Mm -hmm. uh, so you, you can impose a certain degree of piety on yourself but not on society in general. So if somebody says, you know, um, uh, I, I don't want to go out into society because I, I don't want to see any evil, hear any evil, do any evil, I'll just lock myself up at home. Uh, and of course, one would still have to come out for the Friday prayers because that's a command uh, from God. Uh, but, but one would not be able to impose on somebody else, don't go out into society because there's a lot of evils out there, mm -hmm. right? You can advise if you feel that the evil is so overpowering and uh, somebody may fall into evil, but you cannot impose that on somebody else. So uh, the, the, uh, the, the, the um, uh, latitude is already built into the Islamic system. Now, somebody may say, well, you know, all these examples that we pointed out previously about women 
uh, interacting with uh, men and so on. This was actually in the early days uh, of Islam. Mm -hmm. And that later on, this all became abrogated. But uh, that is a, a, a mistaken notion. The idea that abrogation is uh, occurs, th that's a separate notion. But the ab idea that abrogation occurs in this particular case uh, so as to negate all those instances that we might mention of men and women interacting with each other in early Muslim societies, that is a mistaken idea. Because uh, even though abrogation can be said to occur in general, and, and even in some aspects of, of Muslim men and women behaving with each other, for example, the hijab uh, comes to be instituted at a certain time within the Muslim uh, polity. And nonetheless, the, the, the interaction between men and women continued, and this has been demonstrated by a great scholar, uh, Abdul Halim Abu Shukha, who wrote a book in Arabic in 1975 that is now being translated into English gradually. So, so far, uh, four parts out of eight have been translated and are available, mm -hmm. uh, can be easily bought. And he uh, demonstrates from, by, by looking mostly at the hadiths which are in Bukhari and Muslim, which most Muslims uh, take to be authentic hadiths. Uh, he demonstrates that uh, there is evidence in these hadiths uh, that uh, women continue to interact with men in a decent manner uh, with proper dress uh, up until, you know, the, um, the, the, the end of the life of the Prophet, peace be upon him, and even soon after his death. Mm -hmm. And uh, a key example of this would be that Aisha, the wife of the Prophet, peace be upon him, whom we consider a mother of the believers, we say, Ummul Mu'minin, mother of the believers, Aisha, may God be pleased with her. Uh, she, led, uh, an, uh, she led a group of men uh, mm -hmm. to oppose uh, Ali, uh, who was declared caliph uh, within mm -hmm. a couple of decades after the yeah. death of the Prophet, peace be upon him. And they marched mar far distances from Medina to Mecca, and then from Mecca all the way to Kufa. And then she was uh, leading. Uh, the group in battle, mm -hmm. uh, and, and then eventually she was escorted back to uh, Medina. So for her to be able to do this, and she is one of the prime, she's the most prime example of what it means to be a good Muslim woman, uh, then you cannot say that all of this is abrogated, mm -hmm. uh, and you cannot say that women should be excluded from society. If uh, women were to be excluded, uh, Aisha, the mother of the believers, should have been, and mm -hmm. she wasn't. All right, thank you for that, Akshibir. You're welcome. Support us today and help us share the message of Islam with people across the globe. Thank you and may God bless you and your loved ones with the very best always. <laughs>